is Unit 1, The Alphabet and Grammar of Geometry. Lesson 1.4, Inductive and Deductive Reasoning. Inductive and Deductive Reasoning. You should complete this prior to class on August the 30th or 31st if you're B-Day. Please note the location that you are watching this video, the date and time. Make sure you get a parent, teacher, or guardian sign-off. Also turn off all distractions. Please do not attempt to multitask. Stay focused. Before, go, before we go on to the new lesson, we're going to review the previous lesson, which is conditionals. A conditional is a cause and effect statement. A conditional is something that has cause and then effect. So what I'd first like you to do is read this sentence and identify the cause and effect. You will keep the doctor away if you eat an apple a day. I'd like you to underline the cause and box the effect. Do this now. In this statement, the cause is if you eat an apple a day, the effect is you will keep the doctor away. You will keep the doctor away if you eat an apple a day. So the conditional, if we write it as an if-then statement, should read like this. If you eat an apple a day, then you will keep the doctor away. Keywords here are, of course, if apple, then then doctor away. That's your conditional. If you eat an apple a day, you will keep the doctor away. I'd like you to take a moment and attempt from memory to write the converse, the inverse, and the contrapositive. Go! All right. Remember, converse means to switch. So the switch should read something like this. If you keep the doctor away, then you eat an apple a day. So you switch the apple and doctor. Inverse is you negate. So you keep the same original. The original is apple then doctor. So you write, if you don't eat an apple a day, then you don't keep the doctor away. So this one is what's called a negate, where you say the opposite of. And the last one is you do both. The contrapositive, you switch and negate. You switch and negate. So this one, you should have read the original as Apple Doctor. So you write, if you don't keep the doctor away, then you don't eat an apple a day. That would be the switch and negate. So you have conditional, if then, converse switch, inverse negate, contrapositive, switch and negate. Now let's move on to some new logic rules. Today we're going to talk about inductive and deductive reasoning. Before you end today, you're going to know these terms. 
inductive, deductive, law of syllogism, law of detachment, law of contrapositive, then conjunctions and disjunctions. Let's take a close look at these pictures of golfers. Take a close look. These are all different pictures of famous golfers. If you golf, you'll probably recognize all of them. I only recognize a couple of them. Take a close look and ask yourself, in every picture, in every picture that you can see, what article of clothing is common to all of them? Look very closely. What do you notice? A common piece of clothing. You should notice that in all the pictures, every one of these golfers are wearing a hat. In fact, they're specifically wearing a baseball cap. So let's say you were to attend two or three hundred matches of pro golfers. And you followed every single one of them around. And every single time you saw a pro golfer, they walked onto the green wearing a baseball cap. After all of those observations, you might come to a conclusion. So let's say you knew nothing about professional golf attire. So to learn more, you decide to attend all the professional golf matches in a single year and observe very closely each golfer's outfit. After observing hundreds of professional golfers in the course, you conclude, conclude, after observation, so circle the word conclude, write the word observations, plural, after hundreds of observations, you conclude that if someone is a golfer, professional golfer, then he or she always wears a baseball cap on the course. Circle the word if and then. This, therefore, you come to the general conclusion that all professional golfers wear hats on the course. This is an example when you go from multiple observations to a generalized conclusion. This is an example of inductive reasoning. You take in observations, hundreds and hundreds of observations, hundreds and hundreds of observations, and you come to a general conclusion. That's called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning. So let's talk a, more, a little bit more about that. Inductive reasoning is when you have multiple observations, In our case, we had multiple golfer observations. And then you come to a general truth, generalized truth. In other words, you discover truth. Write the word discover. You discover a general truth. That's called inductive reasoning. You take in multiple observations, and you come to a general truth. Now, let's say you go to some sort of party at a friend's house, and you, there's a gentleman that walks in, and he's dressed in a business suit, but he's introduced to you as, let's say he's introduced to you as Mr. Taylor, and you're told that he is a professional golfer. Now, so then you go, aha, I know something about professional golfers. I have a general truth. 
And when you apply that general truth to a specific situation, in other words, Mr. Taylor, the professional golfer, even though at that moment that golfer is not wearing a baseball cap because he's at a party, maybe he's in a business suit, some sort of business gathering, you can say, you can apply it to a specific situation, Mr. Taylor must wear a baseball cap on the green. That's called the application of truth. So when one, you discover a truth, the other, you apply a truth. So let's go back to our example one more time. I want you to read this paragraph and determine an assumption. Read that paragraph now. So here you meet Mr. Vu, and even though at the restaurant Mr. Vu does not wear a baseball cap, if he tells you that he's a professional golfer, because of our deductive reasoning, we are going to assume that he wears a baseball cap when he's on the golfing green. That is an example of deductive reasoning. So in deductive reasoning, we discover truth. Uh, inductive reasoning, we discover truth. Deductive reasoning, we apply truth to a specific situation, in this case, a Mr. Tin Vu. There's another concept of logic that is also used in your English class, and that is the concept of conjunction. Underline the word conjunction. Write the word and above it. Versus disjunction, write the word or above it. A conjunction is an and statement. An and statement, and statements are only true if both parts are true. So underline the word both parts are true. Say this out loud with me again. Put your finger there, read it out loud. A conjunction is an and statement, an and statement. And statements are true if both parts are true. This will be explained further in class. For now, just write it down. A disjunction, underline dis, Above it, write the word or. A disjunction is an or statement. Or statements are only false if both parts are false. A disjunction is an or statement. Or statements are only false if both parts are false. Okay, what I'd like you to do is put your finger right there at the word Tina, and I'd like you to finger track, put your finger on the paper, please do this. Yes, there's no witnesses, but do it anyways, because I'm asking you to. Put your finger right there at Tina, and now you're going to finger track and read. So read aloud as I track. You read. Tina is a freshman student who takes the following courses. Biology, English College Prep, Algebra, Global Studies, 2, PE, New Testament Survey, and a Hip Hop Dance Class. So let's look at what she has. Now ask yourself, knowing all of this is given as true, this is true information about Tina. What I'd like you to do is read these sentences and determine whether this disjunction or conjunction 
is true or not. So read each one of these and determine whether or not with that given scenario if it's true or false. Hit the pause button, fill that out now. Okay, let's check your work. It says Tina is taking a biology class and geometry. Because this is and, both must be true in order for this to be true. So let's see. She is taking biology, but she's not taking geometry. She's taking algebra. So this is a false statement because the geometry, this is a true and false. Therefore, since it's a conjunction, a conjunction is true only if both parts are true. So this would be considered overall a false statement. Let's try another one. Tina is taking algebra and biology. Let's see, algebra, there's algebra, that's true, and biology. Circle biology, that's true as well. And this is an and statement. In an and statement, both parts must be true in order for the whole thing to be true. We have two trues and an and, so this whole thing is true. Let's try another one. Tina is taking Global Studies 2 or European history. Take a look up here. There's Global Studies 2. Now she's not taking European history, but this is an or statement. In order for an or statement to be false, both must be false. In the kids' case, this one's true and this one's false, but we have an or statement. That's a disjunction so only one of them needs to be true here. So the overall statement is still true because she is taking global studies. Last one. Tina is taking geometry or theater. Again, that's a disjunction. So in order for it to be false, they must both be false. Let's see here. Is she taking geometry? No, she's taking algebra. So that's a false statement. Is she taking theater? No, she's taking a hip-hop class, so that's false. The connector there is OR, so the overall truth value is this is false. Check your work and see if you did those correctly. Now I'm going to teach you three laws of logic. Three laws of logic. Those laws are, the first law we're going to talk about is the law of contrapositive. The second law we're going to talk about is called the law of detachment. And the third law we're going to talk about is the law of syllogism. Now, even though there's fancy names here, these are still very common occurrences. You'll recognize the logic behind these. So don't allow the fancy words to confuse you. Let's start with contrapositive. We actually already talked about this. Contrapositive. Here we have a conditional. If, I'd like you to box the word if, if you drive a mini, underline mini, if mini, then, box the word then, you drive a car. Now that is a true statement because minis are cars. A Mini Cooper, of course. What I'd like you to do is write the contrapositive of that statement. Remember, contrapositive is where you do both. You switch it and you negate. Go ahead and write what would be the contrapositive here. Okay, let's take a look. This one says, first, we now start with car. We have to switch 
then we have to negate it as well. So if we don't drive a car, if you don't drive a car at all, then you don't drive a Mini Cooper. Now think about that. If you don't drive a car, then you don't drive a Mini Cooper. Is that a true statement? And the answer is yes, because if you don't drive a car, then of course you don't drive a Mini Cooper, because a Mini Cooper is a car. So this is the first law here. We're going to use symbols, and I'm going to use uh, P and Q to replace the words, just like you in algebra, we replace a number, let's say 12, with the variable x. We replace x stands for numbers. In this logic rule, we're going to replace words with the variables PQ. Why PQ? No clue. Someone long time ago decided to use P and Q as variables just like we use X for numbers and that's what stuck. So the symbols look like this. If P then Q, that's a conditional statement, is true. What's also true is the contrapositive, where you switch and negate. So first you switch, we say Q, then P, and then we use this symbol to mean the opposite of. That means the opposite of Q and the opposite of P is also true. That's called the law of contrapositive. If P then Q is true, then the switch and negate, or the contrapositive, is also a true statement. That's called the law of contrapositive. Next one's called law of detachment. Law of detachment. But also you could think of it as law of deduction, which is we're going to go from a generalization to a specific situation. Let's say you're given a conditional. If you own a car, then you can drive yourself to work. So box the word, if you own a car, underline own a car, then box the word then, you can drive yourself to work. Right here, this is a general truth. General truth. We're given that's a general truth. If you have a car, you can drive to work. Now, apply it to a specific situation. If Amon owns a car, Then you write the proper conclusion. Go. You should have written something like if Amon, if Amon owns a car, then Amon can drive himself to work. The symbols we would use for this is this. We would say if P then Q is true and P alone true, then Q is true true. If the conditional if P then Q is true and P is true, then Q is true. Let's try that again. The conditional, if you own a car, you drive yourself to work. That's the P then Q is true. Then we have a specific P alone is true. Amon owns a car. Then we can say the specific Q is true. Amon 
can drive himself to work. That's called law of detachment. Law of detachment. So, so far we have two laws here. We have the law of conditional, uh, contrapositive, and the law of detachment. The last one, guaranteed, you've heard this before, absolutely guaranteed. You get this a lot from parents and teachers and coaches. You get a, what is called a law of syllogism. Law of syllogism, very fancy word for something you truly know. Take a shot at this. If you get a job, box this, underline job, if you get a job, then you can earn money. Box then, underline money. If you earn money, notice the connection, if you earn money, then you can purchase a car. Now, after reading these two statements, write down what would be the most obvious conclusion. You should have connected the fact job then car. That's called a law of syllogism. Law of syllogism. Therefore, if you get a job, then you can buy a car. You connect first to second, second to third, then you can connect the first to the third. That's called law of syllogism. The symbols are going to look like this. If P, then Q is true, and if P, then Q is true, and Q, then R is also true, then P then R must be true. That would be the symbol that's called law of syllogism. So we have these three laws. Now we're going to apply them. Now this is going to get a little tricky, so be patient. Okay, it says, assume, assume the given statement is true, then determine which of the subsequent statements must also be true. And that's according to the laws that you have learned. The law of contrapositive, the law of detachment, and the law of syllogism. Okay, you ready? Here is the given statement that's assumed to be true. So put in parentheses, we're given that this starting statement is true. If Tom sings, then his dog barks. If his dog barks, then his neighbors become angry. That's a true statement. What I'd like you to do is read these statements and then determine according to the three laws you just learned whether or not they also must forced to be true. Hit pause, choose, and then come back. All right, let's check this out. It says here, if let me use colors here. If Tom sings, we're going to call that P, then his dog barks, we'll call that Q. And if his dog, and if his dogs bark, that's dogs again, that's Q, then his neighbors become angry. We'll call that R. It's a third statement. Now, if, if that's all true, let's write that down. We're told if P then Q is true, 
and if Q then R is true, according to this statement, what else must be true? Okay, first statement, if the dog barks, then Tom sings. Let's see what happened here. We're told sing then bark is true. What we have here is bark then sing. That is the, just the converse. And in our laws of logic, the converse is not forced to be true, only the contrapositive. So this should have been marked false because it's not always going to be true. Only the contrapositive is true. Hmm. Let's see what else. It says, if the neighbors do not become angry, then the dog does not bark. Okay, the neighbors was R. Dog does not bark is Q. And notice that we've negated both of them. So we have opposite R, then opposite Q. Take a close look. What we have going on here, we've both switched and negate. That's the contrapositive. Positive. And if the conditional is true, the contrapositive must also be true. That was the first law. So this one is true. Let's try another one. If Tom sings, that's P, then his neighbors become angry. That's our R. That is syllogism because Tom sings, dogs bark, dogs bark, neighbors become angry, therefore Tom sings, neighbors become angry. That is the law of syllogism. If P, then R. The law of syllogism says that that's going to be true. Next one. If Tom does not sing, then the dogs do not bark. So Tom is P, and dogs bark is Q. But now we're negating, so we're saying opposite of P, then opposite of Q. Let's take a look at our original. If P, then Q, and here we have opposite P, opposite Q. This is only the negate. This is the inverse. The inverse is not forced to be true. So because it's not forced to be true, we would call this false. Next statement says, neighbors are angry. It's just R all by itself. Because Q all by itself, dog's bark is not mentioned, this would be false. Let's try this one. We'll do more of these in class. This may be really confusing right now. Just kind of go along with the flow. Let's do the last one together. Dog's bark is Q. Tom Singh is P. But notice if the dog does not bark, it's opposite Q. Then, Tom did not sing opposite P. Look really close. We are given if P then Q is true. That's our conditional. Notice that what we've done here, we've both done the switch and negate. That's the contrapositive. Contrapositive. And we were told the law of contrapositive says that if the conditional is true, the contrapositive is also true. So this one would be true. If you are totally confused at the moment, do not fear. We will do this multiple times in class until you know these laws down pat. For now, just quickly review these statements and we'll do more in class.